Thank you very much. And um, I'd like to welcome you all as well. And also the millions of viewers. I believe we're being um, broadcast live all around the world. So welcome to people watching from all parts of the globe. So it's my honour to introduce uh, Dr. Joe, as he's affectionately known in Australia. Joe is a general practitioner, but he's not your average doctor. Um, last week when I rang Joe, he was deep in the Australian outback uh, doing health checks on Aboriginal children for a health program. Uh, he's a consultant to the health industry. He's an advisor for medical conferences. He's an advisor for a medical cannabis company. He was, a, was previously a senior member of the Australian Medical Association and much more, I could go on. But he has a special passion for communicating the mysteries of medicine to the general public. He has a regular radio and, radio and television spots. He's written two books. He has a comprehensive website and blog which has everything you've ever needed to know about health. And I think his most important and most impressive achievement is he has 39,000 Twitter followers. So I'm re I only have 1,000. I, I need to get some advice on that. Um, but in between all this, he actually sees patients in his general practice. So he's a real doctor as well. In fact, he developed an interest in vaping from listening to his patients and hearing their stories. Um, those anecdotes that we told aren't really science. But of course, in clinical practice, we know that real people are quitting. And hearing those stories is very powerful. And Joe became an advocate for vaping. He joined the Australian Tobacco Harm Reduction Association uh, as a board member, and he's been campaigning ever since. Tobacco harm reduction has an increasingly strong evidence base, thanks to many of the people in this room. But the public is more confused than ever. And what we need more than anything is uh, a way to communicate the science to the public, to the media, to health professionals and other policy makers. And Joe is going to share some of his communication secrets with us tonight and tell us how to do that. So over to Joe. Great, thanks very much, Colin. And uh, it looks lovely to see so many people here this evening and uh, yes, uh, beaming out around the, around the world. So um, in all sorts of time zones. So hello to everybody um, out there. We're going to talk, and, and the, the topic I've broadened from the brief that I was given, so we're, we're looking at rethinking nicotine. It was originally the media and the medical profession, but it's beyond the media and the medical profession because it involves the politicians and the public. And if we're about trying to get change, then we really need to look at all of these aspects and how do we communicate with all these different, you know, with all these different groups. So that's what we're going to touch on and, and go through some ideas tonight. And um, in amongst all of that, and we'll stir the pot a little bit, and um, it's likely not on everything I say. It's certainly not an expectation that everybody has to agree with it. Um, but hopefully it gives you pause for, uh, for thought. And if you violently disagree with something I say, well, that's good too. I think it's, it's, it's worthwhile um, in, in giving a, a, an oration named after an individual just to sort of touch on, well, why does one give, you know, why does one name a talk after an individual person? What is the background? Now, I'm sure a lot of you in the room will be familiar with, with Michael Russell. Some of you may not be. But he was a man ahead of his time in that he, in the, in the 60s and 70s, concluded that nicotine was what drove people to smoke, but it wasn't the primary problem. So we had this sort of separation of nicotine and cigarette smoking. So you've got this one part that people do it because of the effects of, of nicotine. Again, rightly or wrongly, people have opinions on that. But that wasn't the part that was doing them harm. He was very, very good at designing trials. Um, and he understood harm reduction. Now, we're talking 40-something years ago when really the, the notions of harm reduction almost did not, you know, did not exist. And yet we find in 2018 that we're still having the same battles. So even though these ideas have been around for quite a long time and were pioneered by Michael Russell, you know, nearly you know, 40, even nearly 50 years later, uh, we still find that we're having to, to run these arguments and try and convince people that less harm is better than more harm, which you'd think would be a bit of a no-brainer. Um, but anyway, 
So to that extent, I'm very uh, grateful to the organisers for, for inviting me to come and do this, this talk. Um, I do have to point out, and it's often when you do talks, you do disclaimers, and I do talks for the general public, um, I always do point out that I'm not giving specific medical advice, and there's a bit of a legal disclaimer. So I think it's important to say that not everybody thought it was a good idea that, that I gave this oration, and um, um, a particular person with a Twitter handle, uh, Simon Chapman 6, um, and you can see there on the tweet, the Aussie tobacco control expert speaking at the next global forum on nicotine, I'm struggling to find his expertise. Um, and I'm not standing here as a researcher or somebody who's published lots of papers. That's not what I do. Uh, as Colin said, I am a clinician and I've been in general practice for the best part of 30 years and um, fell into the media nearly 25 years ago. So I've had the best part of 25 years doing things in uh, writing columns, uh, being on radio, being on, on TV, and even last year made a, a very modest uh, movie debut. So that, that is my expertise. It's not in publishing papers, so no, you won't find me on PubMed. And Simon, if you're watching, hope you're having a nice day. Good idea to look in the right place. And every so often you do get a, a surprise, you do a bit of a double take. And we flew, uh, my partner Cathy and I, from Perth on the west coast of Australia via Dubai to, to Warsaw. We arrived here yesterday. And um, Dubai Airport I've not been to before. I mean, it's about the size of a country. It's a massive place. And I saw something that you obviously you don't see in Australia, which is an ad for cigarettes. Um, but interestingly, what caught my eye first, and it just shows you how we can get a little bit conditioned, um, was smoking kills, which was two things. Number one, and that's why I inserted this slide in even after I you know, completed the, the, the presentation deck, is that's really why we're all here, because smoking actually does kill people. Something like two in, in three smokers are likely to die as a consequence of, of smoking, and smokers live shorter lives than non-smokers. So that's essentially why we're here. We're trying to help these people so that they don't necessarily die prematurely and so that maybe they live healthier lives. Um, but interestingly, I had to do a bit of a double take because the first thing that I saw was smoking kills. And I thought, this is an unusual public health message. I mean, that's the sort of thing you get at home. And about a half a second later, the penny dropped that it was actually an ad for cigarettes, which, yeah, we don't see in Australia anymore. Um, quite pretty. Um, and there is a view that says that if I've seen an ad for, for, for cigarette smoking, that I will immediately take up a three-packet-a-day habit. Um, by some miracle, that hasn't happened. People often want to do more of the same, and we can learn from history. Now, I attended a talk some years ago by a futurist, and he spoke of a, a summit that was held in the late 1890s um, in New York, because people were getting very concerned in those days about building, uh, growing amounts of horse manure in the streets. You can imagine there's more horses and carts, and more horses leads to, obviously, more horse manure. And there was a three-day summit held to try and solve the problem of horse manure in the cities. You know, was it going to be uh, having more, you know, people running around with, uh, you know, dust, not maybe not dust pans and brooms, but, you know, more cleaning up? Um, was it going to be about changing the numbers of horses? There were all these sort of things which assumed that the answer was going to be something to do with, with horses and cleaning up manure. Now, after three days, the conference apparently ended and there was no particular conclusion reached as to how they were going to solve this, this crisis. <laughs> Within a decade, the solution had actually arrived in the invention of the motor car. But this conference was never going to solve the problem by thinking about it at the level. So the solution, I think Einstein said words along these lines, the solution is not going to come from the level of the problem. So again, when we're talking about reducing harm from cigarettes, it's got to be a little bit more than just, you know, are we going to be doing more of the same? Are we going to ban advertising? Are we going to have plain packaging? We've got a whole lot of things that have been done around the world. But really, to solve the problem, we need to go above the level of the problem. And this is where the introduction of electronic nicotine delivery systems and alternate methods of delivering nicotine um, have not come from traditional tobacco control. It was invented by, a, um, as I learned today, a Chinese pharmacist who was trying to cure his own smoking addiction. So the solution doesn't come from the level of the problem. And there's over 100 years later, these principles still apply. But ideas are a dime a dozen. 
There's no shortage of ideas out there in the world. And if we want to affect change in the world, we do need to be communicating in a variety of different ways. And this is what I'm going to expand on in the, the next few slides. When we're involved in a space, and, and you know, all of you in this room are involved in this space and are interested in it, and we sort of live and breathe it, we, we sort of come to assume that you know, everybody else that we talk to must get it. I uh, bumped into a, a lady uh, uh, who I know I hadn't seen for, for a little while um, a couple of months ago in Perth, and I'd been on the radio that week talking about, uh, about vaping on the back of, a, um, of a, a column I'd written for one of the uh, uh, online news sites. And um, I, was, I was chatting, she said, oh, Joe, how are you going? Yeah, nice to see you. I heard you on the radio this week. What's viping? Um, which, you're allowed to laugh, it's okay. Um, which immediately said two things. And, and this lady's not intelligent, she works in the health field. She'd never heard of the concept. So, you know, a very, very quick 30-second dissertation of what, you know, vaping was and, and explained the whole thing. And she sort of looked at me after that, well... Well, that makes a lot of sense. Why aren't we doing it? Which immediately says that if you can communicate a concept in a fairly simple way, and they sometimes talk about the elevator pitch. Uh, the elevator pitch being that if you had a business idea and you stepped into the lift with Richard Branson or somebody like that, and you basically had about one or two floors in which to get your idea across, so at the end of it, rather than him stepping out, he'd say, look, come with me, I want to hear more about it and in a way that's simple to understand. So here we have vaping, it's 95% less harmful than cigarettes. It's the toxins that, that kill people, but the nicotine is relatively harmless. Um, it should be no more difficult to get the less harmful version than the more harmful version. Most people who know nothing about it, who come in uninitiated, are going to get it. Now some people might want more information, that's fine, and that can be provided. And there's all the research and there's all the evidence that's there. But for a lot of people, they're really just interested in the overall concept. And if it can be conveyed in a simple way, then a lot of people will get it. Um, and there's an adage in Australian politics that might be worldwide as well that says, when you've been spruiking a message and trying to talk to people, that by the time you really can't almost stand to hear it one more time is when everybody else is just starting to maybe think there's something going on there. So if you feel like you need to keep you know, selling the, the, the message, then yes, we do. And the other thing today is that there are more options in how that message can be sold. And here's a controversial fellow. Um, again, interestingly, on Tuesday we left home. On Tuesday there was the summit uh, between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. It happened to happen in Singapore, so it's actually in my own time zone, because we're in the same time zone as, as Singapore. And I was watching a little bit of this, because we could watch it in real time, and I said to my daughter, who's 19, I said, that the Korean War never actually ended. There was a, a ceasefire, but the war never actually ended. Now, what we're seeing here, what we're seeing here on TV has never happened before. An American president is meeting with a North Korean leader. Now, has everything finished? No. Has it ever happened before? No. Did anybody see it coming? No. At the beginning of the year, everybody's saying there was going to be World War III. Trump was going to go to war, the world was going to end. But somehow, by June, not only hasn't that happened, he's the first American president, somehow, to meet with the leader of North Korea. Now, do I expect that, you know, it'll all be denuclearized in a, in a short time? Not necessarily. But they've actually had a meeting and they've had a, had a start. So what can we learn from Trump, that every, everybody loves to hate him, but we can actually learn from people who get things done? He upended the establishment, and all of us in this room are tackling the establishment. We are the outsiders. We are the outsiders, and we're taking on the establishment. Trump took on the establishment of the Democratic Party, of Washington, of his own party, and he upended them all because they couldn't predict what he was going to do next. And he keeps defying what people expect. So being unpredictable has its advantages. Now, in saying that, I'm not saying I'm supporting all his methods. You know, I think he does some things that we wouldn't necessarily agree with. But equally, when you consider what he's taken on and what he's done, there are lessons. And we can learn from people who have been successful, even if we don't necessarily agree um, you know, with everything that they do. So an interesting character. Back in the day, if you wanted to get a message out, and this is the other lesson from Trump, yes, you could um, write a letter to the newspaper. Um, you know, if you were really lucky in you know, electronic age, you, you might get interviewed on, on radio. Uh, if you were really, really lucky and they thought you were important, you might get a slot on the six o'clock news. But you were very, very much in other people's hands. Today, you can broadcast yourself. 
You can set up a YouTube channel. Um, you can tweet. You can put messages out on social media. You can have your own blog. So each and every one of us in this room can contribute to getting the message out to the public and to our colleagues and to the politicians. And we don't have to go through third parties. Um, the media in America necessarily were and remain very much against Donald Trump. So what did he do? He went around them. He tweeted, sometimes at 2 a.m. in the morning. Now, maybe some of his tweets are a bit off colour, but you know what? People follow them. And there's a show at home um, called Heads Up, which comes on about 9 o'clock at, at night. And the guy who ran it would always say, look, we're just waiting for Trump's first tweet so we can see what he's going to say. And this is in Australia, right? So the ability to get a message out has never been greater. And the ability to get yours and our message out in your own way and not through a third party is something that can be taken advantage of. Um, you know, we've all got phones. Everybody's got the world literally in their pockets these days. Um, and you can get a message out to people. And in simple terms, it really is bringing it in simple terms. What does it mean for people? Can we get that message out? And understanding who we're talking to, this is a little shot of an Australian beach. It's actually Bondi Beach, so it's actually a lot closer to, uh, to Colin's home than to mine on the west coast of Australia. But um, anybody, be, anybody who's been to Australia, hands up. Any, yeah, we've got a few. So Bondi Beach is the, the quintessential Australian beach. There's a crowd of people out there. And as I said at the outset, there are different people that we are talking to. And the message to those different people needs to be a little bit different. What matters to politicians is a little bit different to what matters to, to the medical profession, is different to, um, you know, perhaps what matters to regulators, and, and so it goes. So the nuanced message, um, and sometimes maybe through different delivery systems, is the way to, uh, is the way to go. And uh, Colin touched on uh, ATHRA, which is the Australian Tobacco Harm Reduction Association, which um, we formed, uh, was formed last year. And we've been learning as we go as well that our initial bent was we need to be talking to our, our medical colleagues. And when um, articles were put up by, by various people who were opposed to vaping, it was always, be, well, how do we react to this? How do we respond to this? Should we be on the medical websites? Should we be on uh, sites like the, the conversation, you know, the academic sites? And the answer to that is yes, and maybe we should be responding. But maybe we should be playing a different game. And that's getting our own stories out there. So rather than be reacting and responding to what other people are doing and saying, why don't we set the agenda? What about if we sent stories to the media? What about if we started talking to, um, to radio, um, radio hosts? You know, what about if we started putting our own blogs out and then other, the other side, and I suppose it is a, bit, it is a battle, so we might as well use that, that jargon, then the other side is in the position of having to respond. And all of a sudden the world starts to change because you're seizing control of the agenda rather than being reactive to it. So it is in some respects a game that we are playing. And I did make the, the, the point to our fellow, fellow directors that we are not actually playing a scientific game. If it was all about the science, we wouldn't, there'd be no debate. There would be no debate. But there is a debate because it's not about the science. It is, a, it is an ideological warfare. Um, and particularly in Australia. So language matters. People need to be able to understand what you're talking about. And many, many years ago, in my very earliest days, um, when I was involved in the Australian Medical Association, we had uh, the good fortune to have some media training some from very gifted people. And the point was made that a lot of the journalists just did not like interviewing doctors. And one of the reasons for that was that you always got the long version from doctors. They, they, they answered a media question like it was a, a, a university lecture. I mean, into all the details. We just want a sound bite. If you're going to be on the six o'clock news, you've got about eight seconds. And um, if you can't spit it out in a coherent way in more than that, you're not much use. And then they'd go on in jargon and terminology, and the reporters didn't understand it. So not surprisingly, you don't tend to get reported. If you could convey a simple message and distill all that research, which is important, and it's important that it sits behind it and the evidence is there, but if you can distill it into, and in this instance, hey, you know what, 95% less harmful. Oh, okay, that takes up about a second and a half. That's likely to get a run. So, plain language, and analogies are good. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things we hear about in, in Australia, and, and I suspect elsewhere, is, is they're all against vaping because it normalises cigarette smoking. So giving a child a glass of water normalises drinking vodka. I don't, I don't really think so. 
Um, and I was very pleased, one of the senators, backbench senators, um, who's come out in, in support just literally this week, um, I heard him, um, a, a spot where he was interviewed um, with a, a guy in Sydney, Ben Fordham, who's another radio host who's been a supporter, he said, you know, opposing vaping um, as, an, as an alternative to cigarettes is like saying we should ban low alcohol beer because people who drink full strength beer should either stop it or drink that. It's another analogy, and people can get the idea of lower strength alcohol drinks. Yes, they're still alcoholic drinks, but they have less alcohol. So again, shows that people are starting to get the message and think about it in different ways. And we need to cut through. We need to cut through. So, you know, those sorts of analogies, people sit up and do a little bit of a, of a double take. So it's very, very helpful whenever, if you're ever called to, to do any interviews or explain things to people who come from a different background, if you find out what their background is, come up with an analogy that would work in their frame of reference and immediately they're going to start to, um, to get it. Um, and again, to, to hark back to our friend the Donald, um, he certainly has the ability to cut through. Um... It's been a long battle in Australia. It really has. Um, this is possibly, um, for those of you who, and, and my late mother was a, a, an opera fan, and when, when I was a kid I used to get sort of dragged along, and I, I have to confess, it hasn't been something that I really took to with, with gusto. But in 2014, the WA Opera Company was going to put on, uh, for its next season, a run of the opera Carmen. Fairly well-known opera. It's been around for a couple of hundred years. Set in a tobacco factory. So Healthway, which some of you might have heard of, was a WA um, organisation, which was set up with the right intent in the 1990s to use money raised from cigarette taxes to, to fund preventative health messages. Healthway somehow got to be a sponsor of the WA Opera Company and came out and said that they would not allow the WA Opera Company to put on um, a performance of Carmen because it normalised smoking. <laughs> and you can just imagine all of these opera fans, because, you know, your average opera fan, you know, just, just I could be wrong, but tends to generally have a university education. They probably live in slightly better suburbs. They, they probably got the, the, the smoking is bad for your message, you know, some years ago. So all of these people are going along the concert hall. They're going to watch this opera, which was written a good couple of hundred years ago, and they're all going to come out and take up three packets a day, a bit like I did after I saw the camel ad in Dubai. Um, interestingly, um, the then Premier uh, actually got wind of this, and it was a real own goal, I'm, I'm happy to say, for Healthway, because their, their board were then really called to account for the first time, and pretty much all the members of, then, of that board at that time are no longer there. But it sort of shows you how, number one, People can run arguments that make no sense, but number two, unless they're actually challenged, this is one of the big problems with the public health lobby and, and what's sometimes called big public health, is that they're not challenged. Their assertions are just let be, and they're never called to actually explain, well, why do you say, on what basis can you say that a 200-year-old opera is normalising smoking? It's a fictitious opera. Um, but you question them and suddenly they went away and I'm given to understand that this year the WA Opera Company will, shock horror, actually be running calm and I might actually go along and see it just for old time's sake. And I think this possibly, this quote from C.S. Lewis, who's a medical, uh, sorry, medical, an American writer, does sum up a little bit of what drives opposition to harm reduction. Of all the tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims might be the most oppressive. It would be better to live under robber barons than under omnipotent moral busybodies. Anybody sensing who might be a moral busybody? The robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep. His cupidity may at some point be satiated. But those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own consciousness, of their own conscience. And I think it's a really important point. There's a lot of well-meaning people in public health who genuinely, I hope at least, genuinely believe that what they're advocating is for the good of the people that they're advocating it on behalf of. But they probably never ask those people. And one of the reasons they never ask those people is they never see those people. Um, if you're in public health, again, you've probably got a university education, you live in a better suburb, you associate with people who are very much like yourself, you don't go to places like the outback in Australia, you don't even go to the outer suburbs. 
Um, so therefore, you don't see all these people who you purport to represent. And maybe if you did, just maybe, you might come away with a different idea. And maybe all of these people don't necessarily want every aspect of their life told exactly how to do. Maybe they want that dreadful thing known as choice. I might have a choice as to whether I would like to smoke cigarettes or whether I would like to use something that is less harmful. That's a choice that as an individual this person might like to make. So again, I think in, in trying to think about why are we pushing it uphill so much, and, and we, are, we are making progress, but pushing it uphill, it is that sort of mentality that we're coming up against. So a few words about, about the home town, the home place. Australia, we all know Australia leads the world in tobacco harm reduction, right? We are sitting here in 1984. Um, and it did. In the 1980s, Australia did lead the world. And it was, it was a really good thing. We've introduced a lot of measures that have been copied around the world, you know, including higher taxation, uh, including banning of, of smoking in public places, uh, you know, banning advertising. There's a lot of things that have been helpful. But Australia now has the highest priced cigarettes in the world. Um, and you can see you know, significantly more than the UK and the USA and in all jurisdictions. And yet somehow, despite all of this, and despite plain packaging and despite ratcheting up of taxation, uh, between 2013 and 2016, there were 21,000 more smokers in Australia over that three year period. Now, in fairness, as a percentage of the total population, it did go down very, very slightly. Um, but the headline figure shows uh, that the total number of smokers increased. Um, the government makes a couple of dollars out of um, cigarettes, 11.2 billion in uh, uh, this current uh, 2017, in the 2017 fiscal year, going up to about 15.6 billion. That suggests to me that they're not budgeting for a lot of people quitting. And when plain packaging was introduced, um, I remember the then health minister being interviewed on one of the current affairs shows and somebody asked them, well, what are the treasury estimates as to, you know, the effect? In other words, if, you're going to be, if people are going to be stopping smoking, there's going to be a less money rolling into treasury from cigarette, from, you know, from excise. And the health minister wasn't able to answer that question. And when they got hold of the treasury estimates, it didn't show that there was any expectation that there would be less revenue coming in. So, you know, it's quite interesting. So it's not wrong, and certainly there's a strong case to be made for taxation of tobacco. Tobacco. But what we're seeing in Australia is that it's, it's run as far as it's going to run. You can jack up the price another dollar and nobody's actually stopping. So again, we are leading the, uh, the world and you can see the figures there for various jurisdictions. Iceland between 2014 and uh, 2017, 12% reduction in the number of smokers. Uh, the US, England, Canada, New Zealand um, and down there Australia, 0.2% decline. Um, but yet, unfortunately, all the powers that be seem to think that we continue to lead the world. We don't. But we are making some, some headway and we are getting the, the message out. And this is this thing about communications. Through ATRA and keen individuals, we've been talking to journalists. We've been briefing them. We've been talking to radio hosts. We now have a significant number of opinion leaders in the media who are on side and who harangue um, various ministers and other public health officials as well and saying to them, why don't you support this? Not what is it or, you know, thank you so much for being on my show. Why aren't you supporting this? In 2017, there was no mention of vaping at, at all, virtually, in the media. This year, we had over 30 hits on various online um, news services, radio and even TV, um, with a very favourable start, uh, you know, start article. So it shows you that we can, we've managed to seize the agenda and we've wrong-footed our opponents. They haven't gone away. I'm not saying they've gone away but they're being wrong-footed and they're sounding increasingly shrill and they're now in the situation where they're having to be reactive. And we've seen examples of that even this week. So what are some of the, the take-home messages in terms of, of communicating? It's an old thing. One, one, I have very, very few regrets in life. You don't want to have regrets in life, but I gave away when sort of CDs came in. I had an LP record collection, which was a little bit 70s influenced, and I sort of um, got rid of them. I thought, well, who wants LP records? You know, now you can, if you want to buy a record play, you can pay $2,000. Um, and I look at some of these records that are now selling for $40, $50, and think, maybe I should have kept some. So being a stuck record and just hammering, hammering the same notion... And it doesn't have to be a complicated one. But these simple notions of harm reduction, 95% less harmful than cigarettes. It should be no harder for people to access a less harmful option than the more harmful option. 
doesn't matter how many times you say it, it never stops being the truth. That we want to support people who aren't quitting. And it's a lot of the disadvantaged groups uh, in Australia, indigenous populations, um, prisoner populations, uh, people with mental health problems. These aren't people um, who, you know, who, are for, who want to get involved in a medical method or, or, or medicalised method of quitting. So being that stuck record does start to get some cut through. And if you say things lots of times, people start to remember it. And we're certainly seeing that with the, uh, with the media and increasingly with the public in Australia. And the other key message in all of this is running your own race. So we started off being reactive and thinking, well, how can we counter the points that are being made you know, by public health and being made by the establishment? And eventually we formed the view that, no, we're actually going to set the agenda. We're going to run the agenda. We're going to run our own race. And I mean, a lot of you from all from different countries, got different backgrounds, different media setups. You know, everything is different. So I'm certainly not going to tell you how to do it in your own country. But what I can say that applies across the board is setting your own agenda and, and being on, on, in front and running your own race rather than somebody else's. And to, to, to look to, to wrap up, it also shows you how little things have changed over the years. And this is, this is a wonderful, wonderful quote. It ought to be remembered that there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. And this is a new order of things, what we are talking about with tobacco harm reduction. Because the innovator, and people in this room, we're all innovators has for his enemies all those who have done well under the old conditions and lukewarm defenders in those who may do well under the new. This coolness arises partly from fear of opponents who have the laws on their side and partly from the incredulity of men who do not readily believe in new things until they've had long experience of them. Thus, it happens that whenever those who are hostile to the, uh, have the opportunity to attack, they do it like partisans, whilst others defend lukewarmly in such wise that the prince is endangered along with them. Niccolo Machiavelli, 1513. That's 505 years ago. And if you think about it today, the establishment has the laws and government on its side. Big public health has the resources. Um, they, will, they do fight and they fight hard. So this concept from 500 years ago, if you sometimes feel that it's, it's hard to be out there fighting against the establishment, um, we're not alone and we're not new. So it's, these things remind us that we're going down a path that has been worn before. But, and this is important, our time is coming. The empire did strike back. And it does strike back. And we see evidence of this every day. But who won in the end? It wasn't the empire. It was indeed the rebels. And they didn't have all the resources. And they didn't have the backing of government. And they didn't have massive funding. But they actually had something on their side, which was the truth and a just cause. And does that guarantee? Does it guarantee? No, it doesn't. But... What it does mean is that ultimately, in the history of the world, in most instances, eventually, truth and justice, and if people have got, in this instance, science, evidence, and right on their side, they will. So on those days when it seems pretty hard and we're disappointed and we just don't think we're getting anywhere, um, sometimes it is darkest before the dawn. So to end on an upbeat note, because it can sometimes be frustrating and, and people can feel isolated and they're trying to get this message out, and hopefully through this talk you've got a few different um, ideas Years, and I'm happy to talk to people afterwards uh, who, want, who want to pick my brains. It's also important to de-stress. You know, it's sometimes when we get down, sometimes we just get so wound up in what we're doing. So it is important at times spend a day doing nothing. Let your mind wander. Let nature entertain you. Let stress go and let peace in. Thank you so much.